Hi guys, welcome back to Doc Clay's Chemistry Lessons. Today we're going to look at rates of reaction and importantly we're going to be looking at measuring rates of reaction. So the purpose of today's lesson, we're going to be able to recall the equation for rates of reaction which we saw in earlier lessons, describe with examples three different ways to measure the rate of reaction and finally we're going to identify the best method to measure the rate of reaction from a given equation. So, first of all, without further ado, let's see if we can remember what measuring the rate of reaction, let's see if we can remember what the rate of reaction equation was. I'll give you a couple of seconds there to think about it. Did you get it? That's it. So it's either amount of reactant used or amount of product formed over the time divided by the time it takes for those things to happen. So the first method, method one, is a precipitation type of reaction and this is where we're going to measure the amount of product formed in a given time and the classic example and one we'll see in class is the reaction of sodium thiosulfate with an acid. So sodium thiosulfate to start with over here is importantly colorless solution it's aqueous so it dissolves in water and when it reacts with hydrochloric acid it forms sulfur now sulfur you may have come across before is a yellow solid and so as you mix the two things together if you put something underneath the solution, such as, in this case, a black cross, and you observe by looking down through the solution at the black cross, if you wait for a given time, some point in the future, as the yellow solid sulfur forms, you will no longer be able to see the black cross and at that point there you can stop the stopwatch and you can say that the reaction has come to some sort of completion and you can compare that then between different reactions and you'll get different rates of reaction so there we go method one precipitation where we form a solid so we are measuring in the experiment the amount of product formed in a given time so now let's go ahead and look at method two. Method two is then when we can measure the change in mass. So which instant do you think we're going to be measuring here? Are we going to be measuring the amount of reactant used or the amount of product formed in a given time? I'll give you a second to think about that. That's right. We're really measuring the amount of reactant used because the product here is given, being given off. What sort of state do we have to have in the product in order for this reaction to work? That's right, we have to have a gas and you might be able to see that in the picture. We've got some bubbles that we can see forming in the gas mixture which I'm just going to highlight here. There we go, so we've got some gas bubbles giving off and as the reaction continues, the bubbles will keep forming, and so the mass will go down. How can we tell when the reaction stopped in this experiment? That's right, we've got two possible ways of doing it. Either the mass is going to stop decreasing with time, or we'll no longer be able to see any gas bubbles forming. You might also be able to think about what sort of reaction. You might be able to think of an example. Can you come up with one? You might have seen one in perhaps year nine, something like that, where we have a reaction, say, with magnesium, which is a solid metal. And we might have an acid. We'll just use hydrochloric acid. And you might remember what these two things go on to make. That's right. And salt, metal salt, which is magnesium 
chloride and the gas which is hydrogen. I've run out of room there just to squeeze that in. I'll put those underneath in symbols. So we've got Mg plus HCl for hydrochloric acid. Now the magnesium is a solid. The hydrochloric acid is aqueous, which remember means dissolved in water. We make MgCl2, which is aqueous. And we make hydrogen gas, which is going to be given off. Now, before we go anywhere else, we just need to balance that equation. I look at the left hand side, I've got one magnesium, one on the right, one hydrogen on the left, two on the right, one chlorine on the left, two chlorines on the right. So I'm just going to add a two in front, remember, of the HCl to balance up the equation. Things to note we have a solid. We have an aqueous solution of hydrochloric acid. Then we have magnesium chloride, which is aqueous. So we make another colourless solution. And we've got hydrogen gas, which is given off. So the, the mass will go down with time. The final thing to say with this one is, can we remember the test for hydrogen gas? That's right, it's a squeaky pop test. But here in the uh, Edexcel IGSE, there's a really important statement about hydrogen gas. So we have to say, insert a lit splint, produces a squeaky pop. Now that's slightly more specific than you might have come across, but we have to have squeaky pop and the idea of a lit splint for the test for hydrogen gas, if we ever asked for it. So there we go, method two, change in mass. Here we can measure how much hydrogen gas is produced, making sure that we take a stopwatch to check the time. We'll now move ourselves on to method three, the final method, which involves making a gas again. Perhaps you can come up with a way that we might be able to do this. Here we go then. So method three, the volume of gas given off. So last time, similar reaction occurring. We were looking at how much gas was given off and therefore we can measure the decrease in mass. So we were really measuring how much reactant was used up in a given time. This time, however, we got a slightly different setup. We've got no mass balance underneath. And instead of our conical flask being open to the atmosphere, it now has a bung in the top of it. So it's now sealed, and there's in a glass tube, which we can see goes up here and goes to a syringe. As a reaction occurs, those gas bubbles inside from the reaction mixture bubble away, and they travel out of the solution and then cause the gas syringe to move outwards as the pressure of the gas inside the system starts to increase because a gas is produced. So let's look at an example perhaps where we might use this sort of a setup. Hydrogen previously can be a bit dangerous to store in syringes like that and also it's a very difficult gas to collect because it's so small. So we tend to use this perhaps for something say like when we're making oxygen. Now oxygen can be made with this stuff, which is called hydrogen peroxide, which you might have come across, uh, which is sometimes known as a bleach, dyes your hair blonde if you ever get it near it, and it decomposes to form water and oxygen. So if we look at the equation, we have the hydrogen peroxide, which looks very similar to water, but is different because we actually have two oxygens. So we have an oxygen per hydrogen, and this is aqueous, so dissolved in water. Then it decomposes to form 
water. Now, water doesn't get dissolved in water, so it's not aqueous, the water, but the water is liquid. And then we have oxygen gas. And I've not quite left myself enough room to balance this equation. We just need a look at what we have. We've got two hydrogens, two hydrogens, that looks okay. But we've got two oxygens, and then we've got one, two, three oxygens on the right hand side. So I need to double this up so we now have four oxygens on the left hand side. I need to make four oxygens on the right hand side. Now we have also one, two, three, four hydrogens, and one, two, three, four hydrogens on both sides. We have a balanced equation. We can see we've got the gas being given off. If we measure the time taken for the gas to be given off, we can work out again the rate of reaction. So the last thing perhaps just to remind ourselves here is another gas test. You've probably seen before, so this gas test we're going to measure for oxygen. I'll give you a second. Perhaps you can remember the test for oxygen. That's right. It relights a glowing splint. So, there we have it. We'll have a quick overview in a second, but that is our three main methods for measuring the rate of reaction. So, just to recap what we've looked at in today's lesson on the rates of reaction, measuring rates of reaction, we should be able to recall the equation of the rates of reaction, describe with examples three different ways to measure the rate of reaction, and identify the best method to measure the rate of reaction from a given equation. And here we have it. We have the measuring the rate of reaction, our equation, I'll just highlight that again for here it is the rate of reaction being equal to the amount of reactant used or amount of product formed divided by the time taken we then have three different methods we've got method one precipitation forming a solid where our example was sodium thiosulfate and method two measuring the change in mass and finally, method three, the volume of gas given off. And we'll be looking at all of these practical examples in class over the coming weeks. So I'll see you in class. Take care, guys. Thanks for watching.